Can we talk about lectins for a second? Because there's <laughs> a lot of confusion. To. Just eat them. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Help people understand. I mean, when people go to the internet and they go yeah. to YouTube or they go to Instagram, there's this like, it's almost like a public service announcement. That's what it feels like. Like lectins are bad for you and fiber is toxic for you. And lectins uh, are going to destroy your gut microbiome. They are anti-nutrients and they are, and you should avoid eating plants. And I'm sitting here thinking like, is there any science that backs this up? And no. <laughs> I can't find it, right? But yet it seems like a very strong marketing message and it's a it's it's communicated yeah. in a way that makes it look like real science. But what what are lectins? Tell people what are lectins yeah, and so, where are they found and so why should they not be lectins afraid? Lectins are part of a group of foods that we would classify as max microbiota accessible carbohydrates. And max are amongst the most important foods to feed your microbes because they provide their foods that are typically high in inulin, the type of indigestible fiber that's actually prebiotic, meaning it is feeding your gut microbes. So study after study after study has shown that eating a diet rich in max, including lectins, will actually create higher levels of short chain fatty acids, more gut diversity, et cetera. And, you know, the, if you, there are studies, for example, Dr. Paolo Leonetti's study, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist from Florence, Italy, his study that was done, gosh, this must be over a decade ago, looked at babies in Florence, Italy, and compared them to babies in Burkina Faso, and they found that for babies who were breastfed and born vaginally, the microbiome was pretty similar, but as soon as the babies kind of graduated to toddlerhood and table food, everything changed. The kids in Italy were eating, you know, ossobuco, pizza, pasta, high animal fat, high animal protein, high sugar diet. The kids in Bolpon, Burkina Faso were eating a diet high in lectins, high in other microbiota accessible carbohydrates with only an occasional termite during the rainy season for animal <laughs> protein. And occasionally uh, a chicken wandering around the village would land up in someone's pot, but it was high fiber diet. The diets couldn't have been more different, and the results couldn't have been more different. The kids from Burkina Faso had twice the level, more than twice the levels of short chain fatty acids. They had species associated with leanness and health. The kids in Florence, Italy, had species that were associated with diarrheal illness, inflammation, obesity. And here's a really interesting thing about this, Cyrus. Neither group of kids were sick. We're talking about healthy toddlers, but you were already seeing foundationally the foundation, the roots for disease. And we know Italy has very high rates of heart disease, very high rates of obesity, very high rates of autoimmune disease. And a lot of that is because people aren't really eating a Mediterranean diet in Italy anymore. You know, writ large, it is very, it's similar to the standard American diet, but in some ways even worse. And they have higher rates of childhood obesity, heart disease than many other Western countries. So you could see the foundation. And I always, you know, most diseases are made. They're not born. There are some things that, you know, just bad luck, it falls out of the sky into your lap. That can happen. People have a genetic predisposition. But as you know, the genes, even for these diseases where there is a genetic predisposition, like many autoimmune diseases, the genes are just a suggestion. And it is those epigenetic factors, those environmental factors, and diet is a huge one that can then determine whether you develop the disease or not. And again, to me, this is such a message of optimism. You know, we can actually change our genetic destiny by changing the choices we make about the food we eat, the environments we expose ourselves to, even our thoughts, because we know chronic stress has a very detrimental effect on the microbiome. So, so that study really showed the foundation. And then, you know, people said, well, you're compa comparing people from the Mossi tribe who are, eat who are living in a very different way. They're exposed to animals. They're living around more soil microbes. Maybe it was the environment. So re researchers in Boston took nine volunteers and they put them on a heavy kind of Atkins, you know, pork rinds prosciutto diet. And then they rested the same volunteers for about a week and they put them on lentils, jasmine rice, you know, bananas and mango for snack. And not only did they see the microbiome changing dramatically within about 30 hours, but they also saw different genes being turned on and off. So that really shows you the power, even within the same group of people living in an urban area in Boston, the power of the food 
to change not just what's going on microbially, but what's going on genetically. So to me, if there's ever, you know, a reason for optimism, it's, it's this.